Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks for being with us for another one of the thought leader conversations that we're having as part of the American Nutrition Association. And today we have the honor, the privilege of having two special guests here with us. We have Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. And Dr. Fitzgerald is a naturopathic physician uh, in Connecticut. She works with a larger, she oversees a larger team of nutrition professionals. And Romilly Hodges is a clinical nutritionist who oversees that team working with Dr. Fitzgerald. So it's really great because these two are on the pulse of telehealth, telemedicine, making sure, and I, I've been looking at your Instagram posts. I mean, my goodness, all of the great information on nutrition, COVID-19, really staying on the pulse of that. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, Thanks, really Diana. nice to have you both, I, because I know you both so well, and um, so it's, it's nice to have a little window into how things are going for you. So just a personal note, how are uh, you doing? Kara, uh, you know, we spoke some time ago, some weeks ago, and we're probably in what, about week eight of this homestay. So how are things going for you personally with COVID-19 in, in this entire pandemic? Well, you know, thank God we're, we're healthy, we're good. Um, I think we've transitioned to, you know, life being rather contained. Um, Isabella, my daughter is you know, she's thriving. She's got her little Zoom baby meetup and our oh. nanny is with us. And yeah, you know, we miss, I think, you know, I, I miss our greater world, but um, we're going to pivot to this. The fact that our clinic, we have a small brick and mortar um, clinic, but our clinic is primarily virtual and it's expansive. And so a lot has maintained, we, the, the, my structure is, is, is a lot of it is, is, is unchanged. So I would say overall we're doing good and, and you know we've got we've got a lot going on that's important and exciting and yeah but I, I want to turn it over to to Romilly. <laughs> yeah, Romilly how are you, you're in Switzerland so what is it like over there on the other side of the pond what what has your life done and how has it changed over the course of these weeks yeah yeah I mean much the same as what Cara was saying, really. I mean, it's, it's talk about virtual teams. <laughs> We're sitting here yeah. on uh, two different continents uh, having this conversation, which is fantastic. But, you know, most of my work is virtual anyway. So that piece of it definitely um, has, has been continuing much as it was before. We've just got into some, you know, ra new ramped up areas, which we'll, which we'll talk about. But on the home front, you know, everything came closer and more closed and our scope of vision scope of travel has obviously gone <laughs> way down and in some ways it's been nice um, because it brings a lot of focus and you start to notice a lot of what's around you in a different way than when you're kind of looking a little bit further afield all the time so that's been that's been interesting and we've been spending more time together as a family which is also really nice and um you know, so there's there's pros and cons. I mean, we'll be looking forward to the time when we can be out and about and have more choice about that. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's going I well so far. You both raise really good points about really burrowing into family life, being more connected, and even professionally allowing you to go deeper into certain aspects of clinical medicine. So, uh, Romilly, maybe. Remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, there can be opportunity as well as um, crisis, you know, and so how can we find those opportunities? You know, I was listening to an interview with Dr. David Katz, who's the, the former president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and he was saying that this is an opportunity to get the word out about nutrition and lifestyle. So Romilly, I'm curious if um, in your work with the nutrition team, how have you taken this this whole positioning that we can be taking around nutrition and lifestyle and how have you bring, been bringing that into telehealth working with clients getting information out how have you been doing that specifically well you know, i just i just really agree first of all that this is a huge huge opportunity for nutritionists to get in there and be really very helpful and you know even though we may think oh we don't work in acute care or we don't work with infectious disease really you know there is 
so much that we can do with nutrition still to, first of all, at a very basic level, build immune resilience. And I say basic, but actually really, really also very important as well. And so just trying to keep our horizons seeing that all of the time, keeping that within our horizons and our, our scope of vision as we work with individuals. And, you know, even as nutritionists, or we might be thinking nutrients first, there's just a whole host of different angles that we can work on with nutrition. So yes, nutrients is one of them. And um, immune systems have a lot of needs for a lot of different nutrients, including the ones that we think of as workhorse nutrients like vitamin C and zinc and A, but also a whole host of the other nutrients like vitamin E and selenium and the B vitamins because our immune cells are cells at the end of the day and they need their mitochondria to function really well. So there's the nutri nutrient side of it. And then we have to look at like the dietary patterns, are you eating enough fruits and vegetables? That's been shown to help with the immune system and resist infections. Um, but then we can also look at barrier function. There's a lot of nutrition involved in barrier function, which is a huge component of the immune system. And the microbiome, again, which is a huge component, even toxins and detox, because a lot of uh, toxins impair your immune system. So we can help with that through nutrition by supporting the immune system as well. Um, and, you know, not least, there's also all those underlying conditions that increase the risk for infections like obesity and diabetes and hypertension, um, particularly with COVID-19 and working on those in, with nutrition, I think is obviously a huge opportunity. So I would like, you know, for me, I would love nutritionists to feel like there is a lot within their scope and within the tool set that they can bring to the table that has a, a huge impact. Um, and, you know, that's even just before you get sick. And maybe, Kari, you can add a little bit more about the beginning stages of infection and, and on from there, because uh, that's some of the stuff that we're thinking about, too. Yeah, that was that was that was great. Deanna, did you want to add anything or do you want to do this? No, I, I agree. What Romilly said is, yeah. is superb. And I think that all nutritionists, especially through the ANA, need to really hear this, that, gosh, there's so many different conduits, different rivulets of opportunities that we can start to engage with. Kara, you've been in practice for a long time. I mean, are you seeing a ramp up? Are people getting interested in their health in this more preventative way? Do you see any change? Uh, well, you know, yes and no. So just so to answer your question, Deanna, and also to comment on um, what Romilly just laid out. It, 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 so nutritionists, you're absolutely, absolutely needed as a part of the of the care team, essential. Um, when we do think about the early stages of COVID, Romilly and I have spent, well, really all the stages of COVID, a lot of time looking at the literature and time and time again, of course, as you're aware, Deanna, the power of flavonoids are just, you know, moving forward <laughs> in this profound way, outperforming in some cases, you know, the drugs. It's just remarkable to me. So, you know, we're turning up the volume there. I, so, so to think about how people are, think, are, are, are thinking about their health, um, I was, I, we were on a meeting earlier this week, and I commented that I had been in a Zoom chat with some friends, some regular friends, and all of them were, you know, bemoaning their weight gain. Somebody said that their dog was even getting heavy, and someone else said, well, I'm baking, and I'm baking, and, you know, I'll bring you guys cookies when I get to see you, and, and, and the hospital. So our local hospital here, um, there's the ICU has taken over three floors. Uh, the volume is turning down on that a little bit, but we've seen it. We're, we're close to the epicenter here. Um, and so, you know, people have big hearts. Everybody's bringing food to the hospital, but they're bringing pasta and they're bringing, you know, brownies and they're bringing all of these things that, you know, are going to perpetuate the conditions that Romilly was just talking about that increase risk to COVID, not to mention, you know, eating those, in the environment that's so stressful and overwhelming and sort of heart-wrenching. Um, so it, I, I'm a, I want to change that conversation. And so I'm hoping for people who haven't quite uh, embraced what we're doing, that as we move out of the pandemic, maybe some of those folks will take stock in how can I transform for the next pandemic? Can I reduce my risk? Now's the time. And so I think, Deanna, that's, we will see that. We will. What we are seeing right now is, well, there's two things that are happening quite a bit. Our, 
Romilly and I dialogued about what we were going to do, you know, early on in the pandemic, and it was eminently clear to us that we absolutely had to pivot our thinking, our team, to teasing out what this COVID is, what this SARS-CoV-2 is, and what we can do. We absolutely have to put our energy there. This is where we can be most useful. And um, we've been generating it. We have a COVID page on our website, and then we've got loads of social media content on you know, thinking about, again, the flavonoids. Well, what flavonoids and what's the science and what kind of dietary interventions do you want to do? And when, if you're going to start supplements, you know, what do you want to be thinking of and how much? And so that has been, the response to that has been overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Mm-hmm. People are, clinicians, um, nutritionists, just regular folks are just eager for that. The yeah. other thing that's happening here quite a bit is, so our regular patient encounters um, be it telemedicine or, it, well, we stopped in office. And so we've gone to a complete telemedicine model, which was 80% of our practice anyway. So it hasn't been a big shift. It was probably more than 80%. Um, but our, so our regular patient encounters have dropped off considerably, but the patients who are with us are, are just eager for what to do. In fact, we're eager what, for what to do um, and are and taking care of our, our, our family. So, so, We've turned to a kind of, a, it's not a sustainable delivery of medicine, but we've turned to a lot of guiding people towards what they need to do, you know, without a formal office visit. And a lot of our attention, our rounds meetings where we would discuss patients, um, we still do. And a good chunk of it t- is taken up with um, defining our best practices for COVID prevention, for early infection, you know, for recovery um, and down the line. Yeah. Yeah, really well said. It, it's interesting how people are becoming much more aware. They are coming to you wondering what to do. And of course, you're personalizing that approach. I think one of the things that um, the three of us share in common is potentially, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm thinking that you, you mentioned flavonoids, Kara. And, and last night I saw in the literature an article on phytoestrogens preventing the binding of SARS-CoV-2. Oh, so, interesting. Yes, and I, I can send it to you. Um, yeah. I'd like but to what I find really it. interesting, the thread, I'm always looking, as a scientist, I'm always looking at what are the patterns. And sure. one of the patterns that I'm seeing is, wow, all of these phytonutrients that seem to have pleiotropic effects, whether it's yeah. the flavonoids or you know, any, any of these different carotenoids or even now the phytoestrogens. And so my hope is that people become more called towards eating a more plant-based diet, irrespective of their dietary dogma and how they define themselves through their diet. Just yes. how can we eat more plants? Yeah. So I'm curious to get both of your takes on that because I feel like that's the common denominator. That's like something that clearly cuts across no matter who you are, Yes, at the ANA, we talk about personalized nutrition, yet this can fulfill a lot of different dietary gaps if we just eat more. It's extraordinary. It's just, it's so thrilling to see the science. You know, know, the other thing, and and I'm going to hush and let let Romilly answer this, but is the collaboration that is happening at all levels. I mean, the kind of the the preprint, our access to science, peer-reviewed stuff, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, our all the preprint hustle, um, our interconnection, our working closely closely with you and our expanded teams. I mean, it's just the most collaborative environment to um, to turn this around. I mean, it just it's it's an extraordinary, so as difficult and as tragic and as painful and as a, as scary as it's been. The scientific and and, and medical communities have responded with such attention and collaboration, it's just, I just feel a deep gratitude to be a part of it. And then now for specific, over to Romilly. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd like to say one thing about that. Thank you for mentioning that, Kara, because I think that science has taken a back seat. There's been a lot of, uh, science has been maligned. It hasn't been well-funded. Journals have to sequester articles. They rely on external funding. So it's really been a challenge. And I feel yeah. like the floodgates have opened. And like you said, the sense of collaboration, global collaboration. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it does feel good. It feels like, it wow, does. science can finally be the guiding light in yes. this pandemic. We're really needing to lean on some, some entity, some institution, some collective that has some authority and knowledge in this area. 
Absolutely. It's, it's powerful. It's important. It will, it will be lasting and it will help. It'll be the wind, I think, beneath our wings in some ways to just really drive the transition that needs to happen, you know, in the global community for, um, you know, with regard to healthcare. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> it's big stuff. I'm like, oh, I know. Plant-based eating and, and all of this, especially being a nutritionist. Yes. Yeah. I think that there's just so much potential there. And obviously we're seeing some of that coming through in the literature, the preprint literature, but also published literature as well. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's really interesting to dive into how um, scientists sort of screen a lot of molecular compounds for different kinds of binding affinities, different properties, interactions with the components on say the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the ACE2 receptor, obviously like key mechanisms that we're thinking about. And, um, you know, just the volume of interactions that they identify with these plant-based product, you know, compounds is, is phenomenal. And when I was pulling some of the research, you know, I, I, we could talk about many different ones, but I guess I'm going to pull citrus for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, And that came out with a bunch of different citrus um, phytonutrients that can interact with these, um, mechanisms on SARS-CoV-2 and the ACE2 receptor and potentially um, have some kind of beneficial um, effect there. I mean, obviously, these are early early studies and we don't have, you know, outcomes data. We won't have outcomes data for a very long time. But, you know, we're talking about citrus and it's possible for us to easily include something like citrus in our diets. Um, and, and and so I think that there's a huge amount of potential there. Another other ones that come out would be like green tea and curcumin from turmeric as well, um, ginger and quercetin. So quercetin from you know onions and apples, a whole bunches of different foods. Luteolin was another one that came out for us as a really interesting um, player as well in the in the phytonutrient space. So I agree. I mean I, I'm I think eating more plants and eating more colorful plants and variety of different plant foods, nutrient dense plant foods is kind of that level set across all the different types of beneficial diets that you might be thinking of. And it's just unanimously seen uh, reported as, as being beneficial. And, you know, again, within that, the other, the other thing that I think of hand in hand when I think of phytonutrients is the microbiome because we rely on mm. the microbiome so much to convert those phytonutrients into their more potent compounds or more active compounds that can be even more beneficial. So I always think of those two hand in hand. I don't think we should separate the conversations about those because, um, you know, we, we need the microbiome to help us get the, uh, the most from our phytonutrients as well. We do. That's a really good point. All those secondary metabolites and also, you know, just even thinking of naturopathic medicine, first do no harm. So eating these plants yes. aren't hurting anybody, right? You know, we think yes. of how drugs have multiple, we call them side effects, but really they're multiple effects because they're going beyond the organ that they're supposed to be targeting. Whereas plants are able to do that modulation and they're doing it at multiple levels. Do you both want to talk about, you know, Romilly, you just spoke about the gut microbiome. Do we want to talk a little bit about barrier integrity in the microbiome? I know when I was interviewing Dr. Vojdani, he said that what most people overlook is mucosal cell immunity. It's like the first line of defense, whether it's the cilia, the mucus that's produced in the respiratory tract, yeah. and then looking at how undigested food impacts that. So what do you both want to say about gut health in any capacity? You know, let me just, I'm going to just say the first thing that came to mind, it's, it's just slightly to the left of your question, but one of the things that we've been recommending for early intervention or prevention, or if you're concerned about having been exposed to COVID, is immediately pop some zinc lozenges into your mouth and actually repeat, repeat, repeat. You know, there was a pathologist who, who mentioned allowing the lozenge to dissolve while you're lying down. So it can really yeah. be exposed to the mucosa. Zinc is remarkably antimicrobial. It's beautifully antimicrobial. Um, so think about that for you know tending to your mucosa. And another thing that we've been dialoguing about is you know intranasal 
uh, saline rinses, um, using a little iodine, and you know, there we just published a case actually. Rom Romley just wrote up a case where an iodine saline rinse was used for um, stomatitis for oral ulcerations caused by COVID effectively. So uh, directly addressing it with antimicrobial interventions, I think, is smart. And then I'm just going to pivot over to Romley, and she can expand on some of the more specifics. I just want to comment on that, Kara, just before we move away from what you just mentioned. This, these are so good because they're not necessarily all about supplementation. You know, people get caught in the web of all of these supplements, but there are practices. And in fact, there were two publications, you both probably saw them, on Ayurveda and uh, yogic practices to help during COVID. And so they were talking about a lot of these nasal irrigation practices that we know about in Ayurvedic medicine and the different panchakarma techniques, whether using oil, using gargling, you know, it, it's just like bringing back, it, it's like, this is a time of unification and it's not just global. It's how we think about medicine, integrative, traditional, functional. So I was so excited to see these two papers on Ayurveda because Indeed, like this is stuff that's free. It's not like we have to spend $300 on supplements. We can be doing this like now. <laughs> yeah. And it's, so amazing the, it's amazing in the hospital, just to kind of jump on that for a second, that yeah. owning patients is where is, 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 is keeping some of them from acquiring me mechanical ventilation. So just turning patients over onto their belly. And I think a little bit of percussion, percussive you know, effort on the back have, has been helpful for some patients as well. Very simple, very old practices. Yes. And even in naturopathic medicine, I mean, you could go on and on in this, Kara, but, you know, hydrotherapy, you know, hot, cold alternation, sauna. I mean, there, there are so many other things beyond nutrients that it's we need to really be. really interesting. It's because this is, an, uh, this, was an, this, was an, this is a novel virus. It was absolutely unknown to us. It was absolutely unknown. And, and it's, fascinating that some of the strongest interventions are time, you know, these very old interventions that have, you know, been with us time immemorial. In fact, one of the most interesting podcasts I've ever done was with Dr. John Chen, who's a yeah. Chinese medicine doctor um, here in the West. So he's got Western pharmacology training. He can speak in a language that Western trained clinicians are familiar with, but he's got this rich history and he was talking to us about what's happening um, in China and the TCM that they're employing. And it's just, it's, it's incredible that we, we really need to lean on these old practices now because there isn't a collection of really sophisticated new drugs for us to turn to. Right. Ramali, what are your thoughts on all of this? Maybe you could tell us about this case. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's interesting. And we have dialogued so much in our team and with the physicians and uh, other practitioners that track with us about actually this sort of saline nasal rinses or uh, and different combinations of or gargling and all these sorts of rinses. It's been really quite a big part of the discussion. So, you know, we, we, we can't forget all the, the spectrum of uh, you know, different interventions, even the importance of like disinfection and hand washing. Like it's all, it's all in there. It's all part of that spectrum. Um, and the other thing that we've noticed, and I'm sure you guys, have, everybody is noticing as well, is that some supplements are really hard to get hold of <laughs> these days. Yeah, yeah. You know, it is I'm not, not you know, yeah. something sold out really quickly. Um, you could walk into a grocery store and the supplement, supplement aisles would be emptied out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the fruit and vegetable section, the produce section would still be full. You know, yeah. we're hoping that that will continue, that there won't be any impact on that. But, you know, up till now that we have seen that um, that those fruits and veggies and the herbs and spices, they are all still there. Those dried mushrooms, they're still there. You know, that all those really powerful, um, you know, foods for immune health are very accessible. And so, you know, no matter where we are in the world and what sort of supplements we have access to, for various reasons or whether it's because of the um the pandemic and they've all sold out you know we still have a lot of things to fall back on so i also really like that concept of knowing that in food we have a lot that we can work with as well um and so you yeah, and you wanted to know about barrier barrier health or talk about oh, barrier yeah. health a little bit <laughs> um well, certainly through food, like every time we eat an anti-inflammatory diet or a diet that has prebiotics and phytonutrients that nourish our microbiome, that's doing a lot for it. And, 
the importance of that first line of defense. Um, again, I think we shouldn't we shouldn't forget you know, up to you know the, the estimates vary, but say let's say up to eighty percent of our immune system is in the gut or is represented in the gut or at least our mucosal surfaces, right? Because I think we should think about it as our oral uh, mucosa, our respiratory yeah. mucosa, like all of the mucosal surfaces as well, not just in the gut. But if we think that the area of our gut, if you laid out all those villi nice and flat, is up to maybe like 300 square meters by some reports as well. It's an incredibly large area to police. So no wonder we send a lot of our immune system, our immune cells down there to, uh, to do their job. Um, so yeah, so nourishing that barrier becomes a really important target and we can do so much with that um, for that with nutrition. Um, and then obviously we can think of specific nutrients like vitamin A, really, really important for the health of mm -hmm. our mucosa. And we're, you know, we can get that through food as well. We can eat pro-vitamin A through um, vegetables that contain beta carotene, for instance. And so that's our orange vegetables like uh, the squashes and carrots, but also a lot of the green vegetables that hide that orange within their color as well, like the dark leafy greens and the broccoli and all that good stuff. So that's a really good uh, uh, nutrient for, for gut health. And of course, there are many others. I mean, vitamin um, vitamin C, vitamin E for epithelial barrier, barrier integrity as well is really good. Um, protein, all of our epithelial cells need adequate amounts of protein as well. So even as we're eating a lot of plant foods, we do want to make sure that we have adequate um, levels of protein in our diet as well. Um, zinc, and then there's all the, the herbs that we can think of for gut health as well, like the mucilaginous herbs, like mm -hmm. slippery elm and marshmallow. Um, actually, if anybody is interested, because I think that the whole concept of gut health and the spectrum of leaky gut is really interesting to think of as a, rather than a kind of on-off switch, thinking of it as a continuum, you know, mm -hmm. and, and even through the course of a day, some degree of flux of this continuum of leakiness of the gut um, is, is somewhat natural. I mean, we don't want to get all the way over here where we're operating in a different level of flux where we're much more leaky, but, um, you know, it, it is a variable thing even across the day. And, um, we've got, um, somewhere on our website, <laughs> if you search leaky gut, maybe it will pop up, but, um, there's a whole uh, bunch of research that we did about many different components that, that affect gut, uh, integrity and, and surprising ones. So, you know, you can be doing a lot to help your gut, even if you're not using some of the classic gut supportive nutrients that we think of in a supplement like glutamine and zinc carnosine and things like that. So anyway, if you, if you can go and find that, maybe we'll, I'll find it and I'll pop the link into the Facebook thing or something. And, uh, yeah. um, and you can have a look at just the, the, the multitude of different factors that have an impact on the health of the barrier. Yeah, I mean, even stress, I think of psychoneuroimmunology and like the linking together of the immune system with our mind, our mood, our behaviors. And so um, I think nutrition is such a supportive modality for the larger interface. And then to really be shepherding in that stress response, how can we become more resilient, right? Because we can keep doing all the nutrients, but if we continue to be stressed, we can still get leaky gut. I'm sure you talk about this in your article as well and how important that that nutritional the, that article on the nutritional psychoneuroimmunology, right? How do nutrition and stress meet at the level of the inflammasome? Because they do, and they both interrelate. And so, of course, we, we think about that in functional medicine and also in nutritional medicine, how important that connection is. No, I love that yeah. as well. I think yeah. now is the time, you know, I, we, we've been dialoguing again, you know, we, we're, all of us in functional medicine are thinking about the gut and gut interventions, but we're also talking about a, a modulated approach. Like now is not the time for an aggressive 5R perhaps, you know, I think mm -hmm. leaning on nutrition, leaning on the, on, on what Romilly was speaking to, um, you know, gentle interventions, dietary changes, expanding, um, because of the, thank God, the perimeter foods are generally still available for most of us, um, making those broths, um, and just really nurturing your gut and system wide with these kinds of approaches is, um, key versus thinking you need to go in with an aggressive, you know, protocol to, um, really do a gut reset. 
probably not the best time unless you know it is the best time and you decide that with your provider and you know I'm not going to to, to, to hold anybody back from that approach when it is appropriate. But in general, for a preventative approach, I think it needs to be a little bit more upstream, a little more uh, gentle. Yeah, that's a good point, Kara. And even uh, some authors are talking about that with exercise. Now that people are at home, they're thinking, yes. well, I, I should start this rigorous approach. But maybe yeah. that's not such a great idea. It, it gets really back to what the ANA is about, which is personalization. Like, yes. how do we be more in touch with what we need in the moment? And that can change. And working with our providers can be really instrumental for helping us to keep tabs on that. Where are we on that spectrum? Yeah, probably in general, initiating a fasting mimicking diet isn't the best idea. <laughs> but, you know, if you're, <laughs> but if you're, you know, for some folks, I know a, a friend of mine just is on day three. I'm amazed wow. that, she, that, that, that she's doing it. She's, you know, she hasn't left her house, I think, or she's going out in her neighborhood walking around, and, but that's about it. She hasn't even been to a grocery store. It just it seems like that would be so challenging, and it's, I don't think it's appropriate right now for most of us, but, you know, no, certainly think, the benefit of, yeah, go ahead, Rob. No, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, uh, you know, I think there is actually some data on, you know, your imp immune system can take a little temporary dip as you do yeah. some of these extreme and more extreme interventions. Yeah. Um, not that I want to call that extreme. I think it's, you know, it has a, a very good utility in, in other situations, but it's just, it, it can cause a little dip. Yeah, it can. And so for the it, it inappropriately prescribed, it's not beneficial. Mm -hmm. She's healthy. She's doing fine with it. She'll, you know, it'll be great. But, you know, inappropriately um, prescribed, you know, not a good thing. But it does bring me, I just want to say, Deanna, I know you're kind of, um, you like beta-hydroxybutyrate's potential to inhibit inflammasome activity, as I'm sure you saw in that, in that Yale paper from 2015. And I think there's been some subsequent work. But so, she, so this individual, she'll move into a little bit of ketosis. Um, I think there's easier ways, maybe just a little bit of time restriction or maybe a smidge of exercise, maybe using a little bit of MCT oil. We don't have to go into an Atkins or we don't have to stop eating to turn ketone volume up and get a little bit of that anti-inflammatory benefit. Yeah. Well, what I'm taking away from this conversation is there's a continuum. How do we meet ourselves on that continuum of change? And you know, I, I also think that there's a ripple through effect, right? Like even if we did something super small and we change maybe our breakfast or we change our sleeping a little bit, you know, all of this has this system wide effect. And this is really the time, you know, again, to circle back to how we started this conversation, how do we see this as a personal and a professional time of opportunity of potential? Yeah. So any final words to leave our ANA audience with before we, we close for today? That was actually really lovely what you just said. To I think so. I think we should leave on that note. <laughs> you know, that was a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Deanna. No, it's been uh, an honor to be here and chat with you about this. And uh, thank you so much for all the work that you're also doing, putting out fantastic information about about COVID and uh, health in general. So yeah, much doing appreciated. all these fabulous interviews, and it is so great to have Ronaldie here. <laughs> in our yeah. training us today. I love it? this. Uh, all the we'll way. We'll do it again. We'll do it this again. This is your evening time. So, Romilly, thank you. And again, uh, Kara and I both have had the pleasure of working with you professionally, and Kara continues to. So, um, you know, you're you're just, uh, I, I see you as such a role model for the CNSs, truly. You know, being able to burrow into research and then to apply that research, have that translational piece into the clinic. You really embody that. And I, I want to thank you for um, being that beacon of light, right? And, and helping others to see how they can create that path for themselves. Well, no, as I said before we got on the call as well, you know, I'm here chatting with the two people who have probably been the most influential in my career. So this was very fun for me. I appreciate it a lot. <laughs> Sarah, you know, I love you. We've been uh, we've known each other so long, uh, you know, being part of IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine. And so, um, you know, you've just done an, an incredible, I, I feel like um, even though I'm on the pH side and you're on the ND side, I feel like we have some crosstalk through these different webs of, because you're a very research minded person and I'm also a translational. I'm always thinking, well, how do we take the research and move it over? So again, it's always yes. a pleasure to talk with you. Always. 
always. I know, I know. I learned from you. I just, you, you're going to need to ping us on the half dozen papers you just referenced. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. I definitely <laughs> will send you that phytoestrogen paper. I think it's really yeah. interesting. I think that yeah. the story is going to continue to evolve, right? Like, yes. as researchers looking at the system's web of these nutrients, it's fascinating. And there's some cool, I mean, there's the, that quercetin study that's going on in China right now. We'll, we'll certainly be paying attention to that and the handful of vitamin. C studies, the IV vitamin C studies, they're look, and then, you know, we'll have to just see where these molecular docking studies go with some of these nutrients. I mean, licorice, I just blogged on licorice now, folks, if you want to just, again, extraordinarily pleiotropic. I think it's been unnecessarily maligned. Um, yeah. yep, you do have to ingest enough potassium and you should be doing that anyway, but it's a, yeah. it's, it's a potent nutrient who may, and it may have a very important role to play in COVID management. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I'm getting my neurons are firing because I'm thinking that oh wow, there was another publication on vitamin C, quercetin, and licorice, and they were doing a system. It was through Nutrilite actually. They were doing this gene array of all of them. It just came out. I, I think wow. I'm going to post all these articles on the CNS right. for everybody so that everybody has access to them. Uh, and yeah, we we can do our sharing in that way. So again, ladies, thank you so much. It's been a, a delight to have Absolutely. this conversation with you. Thanks to Meredith and the team behind the scenes too. And I just want to close by saying that the ANA is a professional home for the science and the practice of personalized nutrition. If you're enjoying this interview series, you can find all of the recordings on their website, which is theana.org and look into being a member too. I, I really do feel like this is an organization that we can all stand behind. As we come into focusing more on the collective, the collaborative, this is really the hub. This is where a lot of the professionals are getting together. So if you're not already a member, please get in on it. And, uh, you know, this is the time. There's no better time than now to really be a part of this to affect change. So thank you all. Have an excellent weekend and everybody stay healthy. Take care.